Hello, and welcome back to Medical Compliance with Clarissa. I'm Clarissa Benfield, our Global Director and Business Line Leader for our Medical and Laboratory Business at Intertech. And today, I'm so thrilled to be joined by one of my colleagues from our Intertech Assurance team, Beth. Hi, Beth. How are you doing today? Hi, Clarissa. Great. How are you? I'm great. So happy to have you on today. So, Beth, maybe to kick us off, you can give a little bit of an introduction to yourself before we dive into one of my favorite topics, which is sustainability. Wonderful. Well, I am a part of the sustainability team at Intertech Assures. Assures is a business line that focuses on regulatory, quality, safety, and sustainability. So our sustainability team is worldwide. I lead our efforts in North America. We focus on all things technical, the technical calculations related to sustainability, as well as strategic. So when we consult and do advisory, we're looking at how does sustainability make sense for our clients' businesses? Yeah, which I I think is so important. And, you know, sustainability, it's such a broad topic, kind of a buzzword, right? People talk a lot about it. It's used in a lot of different contexts. But for someone, you know, who's trying to understand What does it mean when we're talking about sustainability? Where does someone start as a company if they're looking at, you know, making a difference within their sustainability practices or putting some sort of sustainability policy or process into place? Sustainability is a huge topic. It's quite a buzzword. And I want to say you're not behind. Whenever I'm meeting with my (laughs) clients, they say, oh, my gosh, we're so far behind. Everyone else is doing all these things. Some people are. There really are leaders who are paving the way. And there's people who are just getting started, so many people. And so when when you're getting started, it's important to figure out what's important to your company, what's important to your customers, your investors, your stakeholders. Are there any regulations that you have to comply with? Think about what's going to make a difference to your company's value. Start there. And there's multiple ways to go about it. You can start in, there's many on-ramps. Think of it as a highway. You can get on that highway in multiple places. Yeah, you know, and I I love hearing you say that because I do think that is a common thing that people think like, you know, we're not doing the right things or we're not doing what we're supposed to do or we are so far behind or this idea that like everyone else is doing something. And I think, you know, using the phrase sustainability and saying, oh, we're a sustainable company or, or we have sustainable practices versus actually putting it into place, right? It, it, it are two different things, right? You can you can say it, but you know, how does your company stand behind it? So, you know, a lot of what what we focus on on these podcasts is talking about medical device manufacturers, right? Specific to their sustainability practices and what a medical device manufacturer might be able to do from from their approach for for sustainability. So, do you have any thoughts just in terms of like different types of assessments or life cycle or, or what should someone be looking at as a as a med device manufacturer? Sure. There's two ways. There's the top-down approach, which looks at, at a corporate level for the company making medical devices. Do you want to put in policies and practices at a corporate level and look at across the entire scope of operations and assess your greenhouse gases? So there could be, first, there could be a materiality assessment and look at, well, what are the most important things to focus on. It could be could be safety, could be greenhouse gas emissions, it could be something in your supply chain, but that's on a corporate level. The other way is to focus from the bottom up, and that's looking at your specific device and figuring out its impact. Usually we do that through a life cycle assessment, and we look at all the raw materials, all of the transportation, the energy that's used, and, and Pretty importantly in medical devices is what what happens at the end of life? Can it get reused or does it get disposed? Can it be sent back and taken apart and critical components reused and then reassembled? So that that is those are two approaches, either top down or bottom up. So if we look at these two approaches as top down or bottom up, what is the effort from the manufacturer, right? Like how much am I supplying in terms of information and data? If we go from this top-down approach, what are you asking me for to get started? Like what, what do I have to supply versus a bottom-up approach? What, what would a manufacturer need to be able to provide just to get started with one of these types of assessments? 
So for the top down, looking at it at a corporate level, usually when we do it, that would be a greenhouse gas calculation. And it could also involve a materiality assessment looking at things that aren't carbon related. So greenhouse gas means carbon, carbon footprint. So people are super interested in that. But wait, yeah. there's more. There's much more <laughs> in sustainability than just carbon. So if we want to look at the greenhouse gas assessment, that means looking at we need to get some um, some information about your buildings, energy usage, if you own any vehicles. Um, we'd have to get some some data from your finance department about the uh, what you spend on electricity mm -hmm. or fuel, heating, gas, and things like that. Then we would look at your operations, and it gets a little more complicated. Everybody's different, but <laughs> where what where are you spending your money on? So we'll get finance involved to see well where where does your money go, and then what hap what do you make, and what happens at the end of life of those of your product. And so that information can be a lot, or we can do a simplified version. And it involves working with people in different levels of the organization, procurement, finance, uh, facilities, as well as the sustainability aspect of it. So that's one aspect of looking at carbon. Another top-down approach is looking at environmental, social, and governments. So environmental mm -hmm. ESG is more than just carbon. There's air and water quality. There's there's social aspects about um, how many gender diversity, how many males and females are on your corporate board. Um, there could be things about safety, well-being of your employees, well-being of your customers. And then how do you work in your community? And governance is all about mm -hmm. what policies do you have in place? So we can work with you there to figure out well, where do you want to direct your efforts based on what's important. So those are the two things. And I would say that looking at ESG, and that is usually a small working group of C-suite people who are who have the ability to make decisions and then want to take things forward and put things in place. There's usually not too much of a calculation. It's usually more surveys, interviews. Uh, it's more qualitative data than quantitative, although when it's possible, we get quantitative data. Whereas a carbon footprint greenhouse gas calculation, that's all in uh, <laughs> all calculations. Yeah, all database. Yeah, that makes sense. And then what about if we're taking this bottom up approach at like a product specific level or looking at something maybe you know, it, it could seem overwhelming to look at it from a corporate level, right? Especially if you're dealing with a, a corporation that has many, many different facilities or many different operations. What about if you're taking it from this bottom up approach with a product level or something maybe more bite sized to kind of start on the sustainability side? That's a great approach because it might be something that that as a business unit, you might have more control over. You don't you might not be able to influence your parent companies policies, or there might be things in place, but they don't directly tell you what to do with your own devices. So if we look at a product, uh, often we find that there's competition in the marketplace and our clients are saying, wait, people are making claims and we're going to be left behind because we've been in this market forever, but we're not saying anything about sustainability and we really want to. But people are cautious about greenwashing. They know that they can't say, oh, we recycle stuff. So therefore, we're going to put recite sustainability on our label because they know they're going to get in trouble with, with the FTC in the U.S. or elsewhere abroad in other countries. There's strict, now there's like strict scrutiny over mm -hmm. greenwashing. So if you want to say something and you're doing this because you want to have, show your, um, you want it to be a, a business value and your client base is demanding it, then a life cycle assessment looks at all of the inputs and energy used in making that device, what happens when it's being used and what happens afterwards. So the information that's needed is a lot, but it comes from uh, suppliers. So mm -hmm. it's what, if, you, if you are a manufacturer and you control all the manufacturing, then I'm interested to know where do your raw materials come in? Tell me about the energy of manufacturing. And then where do you ship it to your customers? If it uses electricity, we'll model that. 
and then what happens at the end of life. And we will model that. So we create an energy model of all these different parts. If you if you don't manufacture the product and it's made by a contract manufacturer, then we'll ask you to we'll have a conversation with your contract manufacturer and I'll go over all the data that we need. So we'll get it from your supplier. Uh, and sometimes, of course, there's many suppliers. So we have to figure out what um, how many how, how deep we're going to go in this life cycle yeah. assessment to get that information. And if the manufacturing happens overseas, we'll look and get that. And we will model it specifically for that location. And when it's done, when we have that, we find that our clients are usually very surprised because they had these myths about what was contributing to the carbon footprint of their product. They might say, oh, well, it's made far, far away. So therefore, it must be that shipping. That shipping must be the whole problem. <laughs> and then we show them, well, compared to this other aspect, it's not a big problem. Or they might think that uh, their raw materials are a big problem. But then we find out at the end of life, those raw, raw materials might be able to be reclaimed and recycled. And so they get a, a benefit from that. So when we show uh, the summary slides of our work, it is usually very enlightening to see the impacts. And then we go into the impact of every single material and we show, well, this is what we're finding. So then our clients have information in order to say, well, I think we might be able to make a change with that material. Or they might say, there's no way we can change that one material. It's mm -hmm. very important. So we're gonna have to focus our efforts in other places in the life cycle. And uh, that is, usually something that goes right up to the top. So we're working with uh, product managers and sustainability people. And when we get these slides, they are so impressed that they really wanna take it right up to their leadership team to show what they've learned. Because it's usually, there's usually some misconceptions about what they thought, and now we have documented it. And then when they have it documented, uh, then we can take the steps if they want to put a claim out somewhere and talk about the impact of their product. Yeah, it's it's just so fascinating. I think really interesting in the medical space, right? Because with medical device manufacturers, obviously there is a focus on end of life and what happens to a medical product. And, you know, at your responsibility as a manufacturer, right, goes all the way through as with a medical device. And so thinking about this idea of, you know, how does it go back into a, you know, circular economy type model? Does it get recycled? Does it get refurbished? you know, how is it end of life? And I think is, you know, so important and being able to have this data to say, okay, look, we've seen our entire process and you can make some sort of claim based off of actual real-time data is just so invaluable for a manufacturer. And I think, you know, being able to take that in information to the top to share it with someone and say, look, like we, we now know, right. Everything that has impacted this whole life cycle of this product, which is fascinating. The other thing that you said, which just really resonates with me is this idea of greenwashing, right? Which has become, you know, a term that now most people are aware of, right? Before people would just think, oh, this is eco-friendly, right? As everyone used to say, oh, it's an eco-friendly product or it's a sustainable product. And now we know as consumers, we're much more advanced and knowledgeable that we know that there can be this idea of, you know, this greenwashing effect that, oh, it, it might not mean what it says, right? And so I think as consumers have gotten more advanced and they are making decisions in every industry, right, on how they're purchasing things and buying things based off of things like sustainability, right? And even in the medical space, you know, where we see this lots of advancements in consumer medical products, so smaller medical devices, home medical devices. So if you have a choice as a consumer to, that you're buying a medical product that's going into your home, these things matter to people, right? It, it matters to have a product that is having a lower environmental impact or that is, you know, truly sustainable and not, you know, causing more damage into the environment. So really, really interesting. We have a client that we recently completed some work for that has uh, several variations of a device that has about a three month lifespan different battery options, different recharging options. But in the end, both of the, uh, out of this group of products, they really only last three months. So they developed a multi-use version and they expect that to be able to last about two years. But there's a process for 
refurbishment, uh, checking the charge on it. Even with that refurbishment, recharging, even with that electricity use, the impact is so much lower for that multi-use version over, a, like say, a, a two-year lifespan. So instead of having eight single-use devices, one two-year multi-use device has a significant impact. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say carbon is not everything. So we're looking at one calculation. Uh, life cycle assessment does 18 different. We provide wow. about 18 different impacts, water use, ionizing radiation, eutrophication, uh, carcinotoxicity, things like that. There's So there's much more that gets delivered. So if you wanted to focus on that, you could. But even beyond the life cycle assessment and those impacts, performance is paramount. Nobody wants a device that doesn't work because some part failed, because it was changed out to be a material that was going to lower the carbon footprint, but in the end, it doesn't work as well. It's not as durable. So performance criteria, we call that green R&D. And when we get involved with our clients at the design stage, then we can go through iterations with them while they're doing performance testing. If there's lab testing, we'll coordinate with our, our, our labs in, within Intertech. But otherwise, we can, we, in, while the design is happening, give them feedback on the, these elements like carbon footprint that are important to them. Uh, otherwise, you don't know, and you just are, yeah. the, they're designing in a vacuum. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, to think about, right, it doesn't just have to be at the end, right, where, oh, we've developed our product, here's our product, now let's look at this. But starting in the beginning, right, so you can have these design considerations and make these informed choices based on a this versus that, right? I think that's so interesting, the example that you give, right, of a single use versus a multi, right, how big of an impact that makes. And if you have that knowledge throughout your design process, right, you could make a decision based on that. And I think, you know, especially in the medical space where we see there's going to be some materials that you use that aren't sustainable, but you have to use them, right? That just, it's how it goes in med device, right? There's just some things. So if you can eliminate your risks in other areas or bring down your impact in other areas, knowing that you might use a material that's less sustainable, I think that's really exciting to think about that you could do that on the front end during your development process and make those types of informed decisions. So that's, that's amazing. And, um, you know, one of the other things too, that of course people always want to ask and they want to know is, is this voluntary? Are there any requirements as it relates to sustainability or regula regulations or standardized assessments? Is there anything that we're seeing, you know, within the U.S. or globally that are requirements for a manufacturer to follow as it relates to sustainability? I would say not at the moment for sustainability. Of course, there's uh, hazardous materials uh, and things like that, that that definitely need to be dis declared. Uh, in the US, we've been waiting for the Security and Exchange Commission to release guidance on what they want listed companies, companies to report on. And that would fall into the top-down approach of a company needing to disclose their greenhouse gas uh, for, for the operations of the company. Uh, scope one, two, which is electricity and heating and vehicles, and then any material, scope three, which is involves the whole supply chain and operations. So we're waiting on that from the Security and Exchange Commission. There's reporting requirements in Europe that would affect things from a top down. From a bottom up, with looking at specific for the for the device like that what i see is it's driven by competition and when somebody wants to get out in front of the market and say make a claim that usually spurs others uh to to say well i want to know what mine is because i think we're better but i think so you they have to quantify it so that they can say something publicly about it so that's yeah. that's the regulatory that's the regulatory sense right now is is no no requirements for bottom up. 
Yeah. But, but I think as we always see, right, once countries start taking a position, so if the U.S. starts to take a position or the European Union decides to take a, you know, they obviously lead the way with a lot of the hazardous chemicals and hazardous substances and, and things like that. You know, I, there's hope that, right, we'll see more regulations and we'll see more drive just for all of us as individuals and consumers who are living in this world, right? The idea that there's going to be more requirements and more, you know, regulatory approvals that are required and disclosure of, right, what your impact is, is huge, right? It's huge for all of us who are living throughout our day to day. And I think likely we'll see more as time goes on. Um, and to your point, right, when you see the industry leaders start to say, oh, well, this is this is our environmental impact. This is our footprint. Of course, other people want to follow suit because no one wants to be left behind. So I think that kind of drives the, the competition in the industry in such a positive way. Yes, yes. And and there there is regulation on other materials. It's not at the level of medical devices yet, but uh, in, in Europe, there's, there's the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is focusing on uh, uh, some specific materials, medical devices are not included. But uh, yeah, in time, I think people would like to know more information about it. So yes, no regulatory yeah. pressure at the moment uh, from bottom up, but I expect from top down, yes, on the corporate side, that will come soon. Yeah, so we talked obviously a lot about the bottom up approach, top down approach. If, if someone, again, you know, if there's something that we should be focusing on or someone wants to know what to focus on, is it the material selection? Is it the design? Is it the manufacturing process? Is it all of it? Is it disposable? Like, you know, is there just anything, if, if I just want to take just a little bite out of it today and I'm just starting my process, what, what should I be focusing on? For medical devices, definitely end of life. Uh, what happens at the end of life? Is it just landfilled or can you do something with it? Uh, from what I've seen with devices, that is the most impactful, as opposed to just taking all of those specialized minerals that were manufactured and put into this device and just throwing it away. Is there what can what can be repurposed? I think that what I that's what I see right now in our work with our clients. That's the most impactful. And then you can get to looking at redesign, looking at alternative materials. Yeah. And so you mentioned too, that, you know, within your group, sometimes you'll do consulting and help and give people guidance. Is, is that the kind of thing that you give people guidance on, right? If they, you know, you go through this process, you go through an evaluation and now they want to know what's next. What do we do? What do we change? How do we make it better? Yes, absolutely. That's what we do. Yeah. We provide the advisory to figure out the plan forward, whether it's from the top down at the corporate level, or it's for specific devices, we can will definitely help along the way. It's not just here's your here's your number. We did your calculation. We're 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 involved. We have long and strong partnerships. Yeah. And I think that makes it a little more manageable to think of, you know, as a manufacturer where it's like, okay, we can get this data and you know, you don't have to be scared of whatever it is, right? It could be really bad, could be great, but you know that there are efforts and support to then continuous improvement and make it better. That's a great point because what you said, is it a bad number it, or could it be a good number? It's our clients ask me that all the time. <laughs> is it a good number? They're like, they're waiting for the news. Is it bad? And Tell me. <laughs> it's all relative. Like it's a number. It's a, it's a number, you know, it doesn't mean anything unless you compare it to something else. So are you comparing it to a previous version of your product? Do you have an eco version and now you're comparing it to your previous version? Are you comparing it to a competitor's version? Are you comparing it to the status quo option that is an, an old technology and yours is a new technology? Like, so, you know, th then you can start to think, is it, is it good or is it bad? But we don't make that value judgment. We give you the data and help you work through what you want to do with it. Yeah, that makes me think too, though. So, you know, with continuous improvements and, and doing this ongoing, I, this is something that you're going to constantly be working on. Is this you, you take one product, you complete this, and then you're reevaluating in two years? Do we have recommendations for how often you should be monitoring these things, updating this data, reevaluating or reassessing your data? Yes. If, if, if the bill of materials changes significantly or the manufacturing process changes, or location of manufacturing changes, then you want to update because that number is no longer valid. 
it's a, the life cycle assessment is a snapshot in time of what's happening. And it's good for a little while. Um, should you, should uh, there be a, uh, a declaration, an environmental product declaration of, of like fully publishing this? And there's, a, there's many ways to go further with a life cycle assessment. But those have an expiration date of five years to give <laughs> you a sense of uh, programmatically, uh, the leaders in this industry feel like after five years, something has changed. So mm-hmm. it's time to redo it. Usually it changes sooner than five years, but it's up to the client to decide when they're ready to, there's been enough changes, it's time to redo this. Well, amazing. Well, Beth, this has been such a great conversation. I love talking about sustainability. I think it's so important. It really does cross all industries, right? It, it impacts us as individuals, as consumers, you know, as businesses. So I really appreciate your time today. It was a great discussion. Is there anything that we missed that we didn't touch on that you want to leave anybody with today or do you think we covered everything? Oh, Clarissa, there is so much. We could talk for hours. (laughs) You know, I would just leave it as where I started at the beginning. Don't worry. You're not behind. Start small. If you have any questions, reach out to Clarissa or me and we will figure out the best way. Everybody can start on their own path, their own on-ramp onto the highway. And and we just take it small and build on it. And that's how we get where we want to go. Amazing. Well, thank you, Beth, so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Clarissa. You too.